I think it's taken everybody a very long time, certainly taken me a long time, to recover from that mess. Um, and one of the ways in which I think people are responding to it, and mm. a way that I find really constructive, is to think about a much more um, kind of organic, sort of bottom-up approach that um, for many people, they've, they've uh, returned back to their communities and they're thinking, actually, we have to build communities that work and that are a model of the kind of economy that we want, that are not this kind of highfalutin geopolitical conflict between development rights, competitiveness, whatever it is. And I like that. I think that's a really attractive thing to do. Um, I also like the fact that, actually, we started to think and talk in rather more imaginative ways about what a green economy is. So it's not just about, I mean, I've got a picture of organic veg, but that how, how 80s is that, right? It's not just about, um, you know, kind of growing your own vegetable box or whatever, but people are starting to think about the green economy in terms of real innovation, like cutting edge IT solutions to problems, stuff that's actually kind of feels uh, much more kind of space age, if you like. It's much more attractive to those people who, want to continue to feel that there's a place for the expansion of the human spirit and human businesses and human entrepreneurship. So why do you all sense that there's going to be a but? <laughs> um, and you're right, there is going to be a but. Um, I think all of that stuff is great, but the problem is that it's not going to be enough unless it comes with an extraordinary sense of urgency. Because this stuff is still going on, this clock is still ticking. It's happening really fast, and it's really frightening. And the extent of the summer sea ice in, in the Arctic is the best long-term indicator that we have of what's actually happening to global temperatures. It's not like weather. This is like a long-term trend, and it doesn't look good. At the same time, um, I put this in because there should be one cute picture of a lemur in every presentation that anybody ever does. Um, <laughs> But also just to remind you that extinction rates are now between 100 and 1,000. Shame we can't pin it down to something more specific, but even 100 is bad enough. 100 times higher than background levels, according to the most recent meta-analyses that have been published in Nature. So this is all happening behind us. While we're having a conversation about how great it is that you know, we can encourage kind of like IT innovation, et cetera, et cetera, um, we can't really afford to create a little green economy which runs along the side of the great big dirty brown economy, kind of tied onto its tail. There isn't the time. So the challenge is really whether or not you can manage to make what you're doing in your communities, in your businesses, in your organizations in Scotland, something which has real resonance and relevance across the rest of the world. And I think the proposition around that is that you have to be prepared to challenge the bad stuff in the economy, as well as promote the good stuff in the economy. And Scotland has a history of being prepared to do that. Hunterston Power Station is one of the places where people have just decided to draw a line, right? A very large, unabated coal-fired power station in a country which has some of the most ambitious climate change targets in the world. Just doesn't look very smart. But that's where we get to oil. And this is a very difficult and contentious subject in this country of all countries. But the essence of Greenpeace's current campaign, which is about going beyond oil, is that we want the future now. We want this now. We're not prepared to wait while we scrape every last barrel of oil out of the most dangerous, difficult to access, and risky places on Earth, whilst at the same time starving investment from the renewable sector, which would actually give us an alternative to this. Um, very familiar, it's a picture of the um, exploding rig in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, that spill took months to control and will take years probably to clean up. At the same time, the consequences of that spill are being felt actually in people's pension funds and in uh, the UK taxpayers' coffers. Because this sort of shock, this kind of accident, has massive reverberations. It will cost tens of billions of dollars to UK pensioners and to the taxpayer because BP pays royalties into the UK's coffers. That's the result of one accident in an environment where we know it's going to become increasingly difficult to try and extract oil. Is it really a good idea for all of us to have so many of our eggs in this particular basket, purely from an economic point of view, even if you don't want to think about it from the perspective of the environmental damage that it does? But that doesn't look like the green economy to me. And anybody who tells you that it's a good idea to continue recklessly to pursue the last barrel of oil in the most difficult places on the face of God's earth whilst transitioning to a low carbon economy over some indefinite time scale 
is just telling you a lie, right? That's why there were climbers hanging off um, this drilling rig outside of uh, uh, Greenland in a place called Iceberg Alley about a month ago. The rig that they were hanging off was um, being hired by a Scottish company called Cairn Energy. Held up, in some ways quite rightly, if you're not concerned about the environment, held up as an example of Scottish entrepreneurship. The guy who runs this company is a big figure here in Edinburgh. Uh, actually, you can't run a boutique Scottish economy with a bunch of wind farms and some nice locally produced Scottish beef, etc., etc. If your entrepreneurs are out in the Arctic digging holes in the one place on God's earth where we obviously shouldn't be digging holes for oil. And that's why today, even more contentiously, uh, two of my friends, you can't see them here, but there's uh, an anchor chain coming down from that ship. It belongs to Chevron. Um, it's off the coast of Shetland, and two of my friends are locked to it in a tent. And they're not going to move until we get some kind of sense that actually this country has woken up to the fact that we need to go beyond oil. They're fine, apparently. They say it's really warm, bizarrely. <laughs> Seems a little bit difficult to believe. This is what we think the future looks like for Scotland, but I think we should be in no doubt that there is a conflict here. This is not a kind of straightforward, just have it all, have some oil, have some renewables, have this, have that, the other. You go and poke around on Oil and Gas's website in the UK, they're really upfront about the fact that they perceive a direct physical conflict between the deployment of renewable resources off the coast of Scotland and their continued ability to access oil and gas in the way that they want to. They are likely to set up legal challenges to putting out the transmission lines necessary to connect offshore wind farms in Scotland back to the country here and then to provide power for the rest of, of the UK and potentially to Europe. Uh, what choice are you going to make at that point? You can't endlessly, not challenge particularly the people in this room, challenge to me too, you can't endlessly defend every job, green or brown, if actually you really believe in the concept of some kind of environmental limits. Now, I, I think this is, as I said when I started, the, one of the most innovative environmental environments in the world. So I have every faith that you guys are going to get this right. Um, but I, I also think that if you leave from here today with the idea that just setting up that local business, just doing the recycling better, uh, just making sure that you eat less meat, that that's going to be enough, that it's absolutely not going to be enough. If we don't challenge the vested interests of big carbon out there in the world, then we've lost.